Well, I'm very well qualified to be here tonight. I came to Oxford University. I got a third. It was outstanding. And um, uh, um, I then decided with a third, what could I do career-wise? And I realised the only career option was really ordination. So just to say, if you are struggling career-wise in the present climate, get ordained. There's no competition at all. It's marvellous. You only work one day a week. Thoroughly recommend it. So... So that's what I did. And then I found that actually if you become a vicar, it is too much pressure. So I've remained a curate for 19 years at my church. And I find the key to remaining a curate is incompetence. That's how I've done it. Anyway, as I put that in mind, let's begin together. Why don't we turn please to uh, these uh, wonderful little uh, uh, gospels here. These biographies of Jesus written by Dr. Luke, this one. Page 106. 106, that would be great if you could turn to that. Have I got that right? Yes, 106. Luke chapter 15. And so this is uh, a parable. And, you know, it is interesting the day you have as you're preparing this. There's a pastoral situation I'm involved in at the moment that I'm not going to find it easy at all to extricate myself from. And uh, uh, the protagonists in this situation do not understand this passage at all. And this situation gets increasingly toxic. And unless they do, I don't know where we're going to go. So it's interesting how heartfelt I've felt this as I've prepared this today and been on the phone. So let me read it to you. We'll start at uh, verses 1 and 2 of Luke uh, 15. This parable, this story with a spiritual cutting edge that Jesus told. Probably the most famous short story ever told. But let me read it to you as we look through it. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then on to verse 11 at the bottom there. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Um, It's my habit to just pray before I try and teach from the Bible. So if you bear with me, I'll do that. Father God, thank you very much for the stories that Jesus told and the extraordinary relevance they have to us we just i just pray now that wherever we are wherever we are spiritually this story would make the most profound effect uh, uh, impact on us amen <clears throat> recently a friend of mine who lives hundreds of miles away from here rang me and on the phone he said to me he said rico uh, i'm reaching out which is a big call for someone to uh, sort of you know middle-aged bloke like me to make rico i'm reaching out He said, my doctor says, but really I've had a breakdown. Really it's because I've spent years lying to people about the products I sell them. And the pressure of that has now broken me. I'm missing the children desperately since the divorce. Christmas was was appalling without them. 
And, uh, and he said then, you know, to top it off, a, 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 a mate of mine, uh, his wife, has is, is, is died of cancer. And, and while she was dying, he kept ringing me, and he keeps ringing me now, and I have no idea what to say to him. Rico, I'm reaching out. Do you know, it is a big call when someone does that. And the question is, what would you say to him as a guy gets on the phone and says that? And to be honest, what I wanted to do was take him to this story because it's about life, it explains life, it's about being human, it's about the mess life can be. I don't know, but when times are tough and you have to give yourself a team talk, you've got to find the energy to keep going, to keep achieving. When you, when you feel that despair and you think, I've got to sort of pick this up, this is where I go for the team talk, this story. Because it's about life, it's about having the courage to look in the mirror and say, look, despair isn't far off, I'm just hanging on by my fingernails at the moment. It's about broken relationships. It's about an emptiness that can gnaw at the soul. It's about broken domestic relationships. And actually, you know, one way or another, I think we can all relate to that in this culture. But above all, and this is the issue, this is a story about experiencing a relationship of such generosity, of such love, of such kindness, that it can change any life, that it can turn any life around. So, you know, as I was listening to this this pastoral situation on the phone today, I was thinking... Oh, Lord, if they could just get this. If only they could get it. This story has such power, such meaning, such pathos. Can I say, it changes lives, this story. Well, let me summarise. It's a family story, as you can see. It's about a father who has two sons. A friend of mine tells it rather neatly. He says this, well, Rico, you see, it starts at home. Then the young one gets sick of home, so he gets out, and then he goes to being homesick. So then he comes home again, and the father's glad to have him home, and the older brother's sick about that. He says, basically, that's the story. And as he tells the story, as Jesus tells it, it becomes obvious that the father in the story is like God. So as we just get this story in place, the father's like God, and the two sons are like the two constituencies of people listening to the story. I wonder if you can see them. Chapter 15, 1 and 2. These are the listeners. So here's the context. These are the people listening. So first of all, Chapter 15, 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. That's the younger son's constituencies, tax collectors, sinners. Those alienated in the culture, those massively judged by everyone. The older son's constituency, 15, verse 2, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who mutter, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And this is, this is what's extraordinary about this story. It's as though Jesus picks up a mirror and he says, actually, everybody's in the story. As I'm telling this story, you're all in it. I don't know if you realise that as, as the story was read. I don't know if you saw that you're in it. You've got to walk on par. I love that. I love being the centre of attention. I'm in the story. Great. You are too. Here we are. So let's see how we go with it. But, you know, we, you know, we can't really sit back with this one and just say, well, I'll just sort of rather objectively sort of, you know, surmise what's going on. No, no, we're in it. So as we look at these two sons, what do we relate to as we see them? And I've just got two headings. The first is, as we look at it, is there's a deceptive contrast between these boys. I wonder if we can see, as we look down, have a look, chapter uh, 15, verse 11 there. So let's see the story and see if we can see ourselves in it. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And then the story begins with the younger son, who we might call the out-and-out rebel. And he goes on there, verse 12. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So this younger son, he cuts loose, and he says to his father, he says, "Um," he says, Dad, he says, do you know that life insurance policy you've taken out for me? And the father says, yeah. He says, Dad, I'd like my share now. And his dad smiles and says, well, actually, son, those things only mature when I die. And the son says, yeah, Dad, you've got it. I wish you were dead. That's what he's saying. You see, Jewish culture was just like our culture. You basically inherit from your parents when they die. And this guy says, Dad, I want your things, but I don't want you. I want your gifts. I want the money. I want the inheritance, but I don't want you. I wish you were dead. So the father in the story is a bit like God, and some people treat God like that younger son I once did. So they act as though he doesn't exist, as though he's an irrelevance. They want his gifts, they don't want him, and their slogan, as they take the gifts, fun, family, friends, falling in love, food, fitness, as they take them, the slogan, I wonder if you can see it, it's there and it's very stark and it's in verse 12. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me, give me. I want the gifts and you go. And I suppose the question is, what was it that so attracted 
this young man to life without God? And I think the answer is independence. So this was his independence day. He was saying to God, look, God, I don't need you. I don't need you. So uh, can you imagine? He's got the remains of the life insurance in his wallet in his back pocket. He's walking down the drive and he says, yeah, I'm free. I'm out of here. And the issue is, and I, I think this is a fascinating issue, is that this young boy, as he leaves home, is convinced that independence, wild living and pleasure will lead to happiness. That's what he thinks. Independence, wild living, pleasure, that will make me happy. And there are millions who think like that. What do you think? But that's where he's at. Give me, and he's gone. So that's him. Now, the older son, it may be that you can't relate to him at all. It may be you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I can think of some people like that, but it's not me. So it may be that, you know, here you come. It may be that actually what you relate to a little bit more as we hold up the mirror is the older, the, the, the older son, and he's what you might call the establishment figure. And we learn a bit about him in verse 29 as he has a stand-up row with his father outside the party. I wonder if you can see verse 29. So flick over the page down the bottom there, and he tells us a bit about himself in the middle of this row. But he answered his father, can you see right at the bottom there, look, all these years I've been slaving to you and never disobeyed your orders. So do you see he's the dutiful child? He joined the family firm. He's hardworking, he's loyal. Actually, he's the one who sort of the rest of the family lean on for their identity. I mean, you probably got it. But my nephew, John, just got into Oxford, you know. Really? Yeah. You know the pressure. You're the name that keeps getting mentioned. I mean, the other siblings, the other cousins in the family, they don't sort of begrudge it, but you're the one that gets mentioned because there's a, really? Got into Oxford? You know, and and you've done it right all along. Head boy or head girl. Year rep, society president, get to Oxford. First blue and spouse, wife, husband. You know, it's always there. I mean, again, as I said last night, you know, this is the guy that's read his Longfellow. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their contemporaries slept, laboured upward in the night. That's, That's the older brother. He's done it. He's respectable at every level. Other people get their identity from him and his success. He's an upstanding guy. But, interestingly, though he's very different from his brother, it's a deceptive contrast. He's not like his brother, but he's nothing like his father either, and that comes across verse 28 as we look down. Can you see? Verse 28. When the younger son comes back, he returns. The older brother, do you see it there? Became angry and refused to come in. Typical head boy of their school. Lots of repressed anger. Have you found that? Always so much repressed anger. If you're a head boy, head girl, go to counselling. You need some help. I've seen you. I know you. I know you people. You see? So the, the son comes back, the, the, the father's glad, the brother's angry. The father greets him with open arms, the brother with clenched fists. The father says, interestingly, my son, the brother, verse 30, this is hysterical. Have a look at the brother over the page. But when, is, when this son of yours who squandered your property and prostitutes come home, he doesn't say, my brother, he says, this son of yours. He says, I didn't even come from the same womb as this guy. This son of yours. Not my gene pool. Amazing comment. So you see, this older brother thought he was the model of unselfishness, slaving away. But actually, in verse 29, he uses the words, I, me, or my, four times. One commentator has written, the older son contrived without leaving home to be as far away from his brother as ever his his father, as ever his brother was in the pigsty. It's a deceptive contrast. Now, here's the issue. If you want to think about this God thing and this religion thing, In terms of just, you know, religion, if you think that's what we're doing with Christianity, it's just a sort of religion, then these two are very different. But if you want to think of God and the Christian faith in terms of relationship with the God who made us, in terms of a relationship with a heavenly father, then actually these two boys are very similar. They're both out of relationship with their father. As as I used the illustration last night, for both of them actually, you know, God is not as central to life as a ball is to a game. He's not the joy. 
They're both out of relationship with the Father. I mean, one's religious, the other's not. One's thoroughly respectable, the other's not. They're both out of relationship with their Father. And what about you? I I guess as I hold up the mirror now, what about you? If you're in the younger son's constituency, and it may be that you're here tonight, and actually you're very surprised you are here tonight, can I say welcome? It's, you're, you're, actually, you're staggered to have yourself here. You that, that did an amazing job with your friend to bring you. Here you are. But actually, you know, you're, you're massively younger son. You never thought about this God thing. But maybe you're in the older brother's constituency as we come. You're a respectable, conventional type. You've done the right thing. A lot of the family identity, though you're young, is actually in you. But actually, when it comes to religion, when it comes to relationship with God, well, you, your relationship with God is, 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 you know, it's the difference between a cold, frigid, formal marriage and a real lifelong love story. You don't, you don't know God in terms of a joy, in terms of a wonder, in terms of amazement. In fact, your relationship with God and, and actually a lot of your other life, this is, this is the really dangerous thing, actually, sort of, it sort of leaves you feeling superior to other people. So you might be saying, look, what this country, what this college, what this university needs, what, what my family needs are more law-abiding, moral, tax-paying citizens like me. I mean, you know, I befriend the freshers, I go to the hub, I get my work in on time, if any of the others like me. But actually, if there is that sense in you, of that just sense of superiority to others, can I say to you, categorically, you are a million miles from the Christian faith. You're a million miles. But the heart of the Christian faith is not, are you good enough, but are you bad enough? And people for whom, you know, actually, you know, if only they were more like me, you're miles away. So there's a deceptive contrast. But secondly, both boys make an amazing discovery. They both discover they're equally welcome with their father. They both find it. It's clearer with the younger son. Let's have a look at him. Let's return to him. Can we see verse 13? There he is relishing his independence. Verse 13, couple of pages back. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country. There he squandered his wealth in wild living. So he's squandering his wealth. He's getting everything he desired, alcohol, promiscuity. But what he finds is that instant gratification leaves him hollow inside. So that word squander has a sense of hollowness. And he wastes his life. You know, you know this. You get one life, one short life, and he squanders it. In the film Papillon, uh, it's about a criminal who's falsely accused of a murder but imprisoned. And he has a dream. And in the dream, the judge says, no, 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 I don't accuse you of murder, but I do accuse you of a wasted life. One short life and he wastes it. And what this young man finds, it's amazing. He leaves home, you see. He leaves home with a wallet and he leaves home to get freedom. He says, I'm going to be free. But actually, he leaves home and he finds himself in bondage. He finds himself in famine, not freedom. And it's interesting, he leaves home to be in control. God, you go, I'll be in control. And suddenly life's out of control. He's in a pigsty. He's totally isolated. He he finds the people around him, actually, they're they're, they're not givers, they're takers. There are only two types of people in life. You know this, don't you? They're givers and takers. They're drains and radiators. You know that, don't you? And, and, you know, this guy, no money, no friends, no job. Once the money runs out, the friends go. And he's lonely. And I think you then get, actually here, one of the saddest phrases in the whole of the Bible. Do you see, end of verse 16. But no one gave him anything. So he's utterly alone, a Jew in a pigsty, and no one gave him anything. The money's run out. He's deserted. He's feeling this sort of cosmic loneliness, you know, three in the morning, I'm a piece of DNA stranded in the universe. And what does he do? Well, now he gets to the halfway point in the story. What does he do? Verse 17, I wonder if you can see it as we look down. Verse 17, no one gave him anything, verse 16. Verse 17, when he came to his senses. So this means suddenly he, he says... How could I have been so blind? How could I have been so ungrateful? Suddenly he goes, how could I have missed the obvious? How could I have done this? He comes to his senses. How could I have, how could I have behaved like this? 
And he comes to his senses about himself. He starts to see himself as he really is. He comes to his senses about his father. He starts to see his father as he really is. And he has the courage to surrender his precious delusions about independence. He admits, he says, I'm lost. I'm in a pigsty. He admits it. He says, I don't just lack food, I lack my father. And he starts to long for something that is so innate in all of us. He starts to long for home. Now, what is home? It's not just a place. Home is a relationship. One psychiatrist has written, children who don't experience a home live all their lives with a fundamental inability of attachment. And home is the place, this is the thing about home, home is the place where I belong and where I'm accepted. That's home. Where I'm not just evaluated by my performance. That's real home. You see, the west end of London where I work, and I don't doubt it's like that's around here, but the west end of London where I am, relationships are conditional. We will love you if, if you're young, if you're rich, if you're successful, if your flat's in the right place, which is why there's this relentless drivenness, because people know they've been programmed with this. Unless I win, I won't be accepted, so I must win. I spoke at a girls' school recently. They were right at the top of the academic table. And I said to the chaplain, I said, I said, God, you know, this is amazing, this school. I mean, you know, I've seen the results. I mean, it's great. She said, yes. Well, she said, if the girls don't perform, they go. They leave. That's the chaplain. She was a nutter. What are the rest of the staff like? <laughs> I mean, you know, it was just conditional. If they don't perform, they go. But home, home is the place where you belong, where you're accepted, where you're loved. I've got dyslexia. It meant I didn't read until I was nine. I needed a home where I belonged and I was accepted because I always came bottom of the form orders. One week, a guy didn't hand in his work. So I came, we had a form order, and it would be read out. I came seventh, not eighth. There was a cheer. (laughs) You've got to know, you know, there's got to, I, I couldn't have coped unless I had home where I belonged and I was accepted, whatever the performance. And this guy, as he comes to his senses, you see, he realises he's got to say something to his father. I mean, you know, what's he done with the inheritance? And he realises he's got to say something. And this was the pastoral issue I faced today, and neither party's going to say it. But this guy realised, he says, I've got to say sorry. I've got to do it. Don't you hate it? I hate saying sorry. <laughs> You know, I pick up the phone to say sorry, and I think, I'll just have a cup of tea first. I delay it all day. The Bishop of London recently said, he said, London's biggest problem is BSE. BSE, we all looked at each other, he said, yeah, blame somebody else. And actually, in relationships, by the way, if you're sitting next to a girlfriend or boyfriend or a spouse, I don't know what it is, but just can you keep your elbows in as I say this? But in relationships, elbows in, but in relationships, there are two crucial phrases. First phrase, I'm sorry I was wrong. Second phrase, that's okay, I forgive you. And just to say, some people will never say it. They just won't. And that's why marriages end. But this guy, he knows he's got to say sorry. So I wonder if you can imagine in verse 18, in the pigsty rehearsing it. Because that's what you do when you've got to say sorry, don't you find? That you rehearse it. So he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not waiting to be called your son. He's sitting there, he's rehearsing it. Because it's a tough thing to get out. We're all proud. But he knows that he doesn't just need his father's food or his father's fellowship. He needs his forgiveness. So, you know, don't you think he dawdled a bit, but he thinks, now I've just got to head home. I've got to go to the place. I mean, I'm starving, but I've got to go to the place where I belong and I'm accepted. So he heads for home, and now we get to the heart of the story, verse 20. Can we see as we look down? Verse 20, here we are. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Now, what does his father do? Does his father stand on the porch, tap his foot and go, this better be good. This better be good. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And what does his father do? You know, it's an extraordinary thing. And was filled with compassion for him. And that's a turning of the stomach. So, you know, you see the tsunami on the telly, and I saw a woman and her family had been washed away, and the look on her face, and as I saw it, my stomach turned. Well, that's what the father feels, this stomach-turning compassion. 
Well, his father, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, and, and he would have run, don't you reckon, across some of the fields they'd have had to sell off for the life insurance. He runs to his son, and he, and he, and he you know, and, and, and leaps at him. You know, there we go. Do you see as we, filled with compassion, he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Can I ask you this? Has anyone ever seen the Queen run? And it would be too shocking, wouldn't it? Imagine during the Jubilee to see at one point the Queen break into a trot. It would be too much. In this culture, a nobleman never ran. But this guy doesn't care what the neighbours think. He runs to his son and then it gets very un-British. You know, I perspire with embarrassment as I read this. Do you see what happens? And kissed him and that's present continuous. So it went on and on and on. I mean, I'm so emotionally screwed up. The only people I can possibly kiss are the dog and my mother. I mean, it's too much. <laughs> my, my father, I'm not like father, not like we shake hands. Honestly, we've had it. But this guy, this guy... He throws his arms around his son. Now, this is very important, because what we're being told here is how we can know the embrace of the Father. You know, we talk about, we talk about God. How do you know his embrace? How is it I get that? I mean emotionally, I mean in my soul, I don't just mean intellectually. How do I get God's embrace? Because I want to find that. And you see the steps here. They're so clear. The first thing, if you want the Father's kiss, and can I say, this is real happiness. This is real happiness. It is. These are the steps. Number one, you come to your senses, verse 17. You come to your senses. And you realise, secondly, that it's at home where you belong and you're accepted. It's unconditional relationship. You come to your senses... You realise it's at home where you belong and are accepted. And then thirdly, this is, this is, if you want the Father's embrace, this is how you get it. Thirdly, you say, God, I'm so sorry. God, I'm sorry. Lord God, I'm sorry. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. And as you do that, you experience the Father's embrace. It is the heart of happiness. It's an amazing joy. And then what happens is, you see, you start experiencing that from God, and you say, I'm sorry, and then you, you begin to be able to find the resources to say that to other people, and that transforms relationships horizontally. That's the whole problem on the stuff I've been dealing with today. They've got no idea about this. There's no reservoir for them to go forward with this, and it's toxic. But you say, Lord God, I'm so sorry. And then you experience embrace. And then you find the resources to bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievances you have against each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's it's a life-transforming thing. And for Christians, as they they read the Bible in the morning, uh, uh, the Bible is like a mirror and and it shows us our wrongdoing. And then there's this extraordinary experience in the morning time as you say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lord. And there's that sense of his kiss, of his embrace. So I'd say, just brother, sister, if you're a Christian here tonight, again, thanks for coming, but how's your morning Bible reading going? Because can I say... As we get the Bible open and we see that, that's, that's the heart of where we're at. It's the heart of happiness as we come back to the Father each day. So you see, although this man had forgotten about his father, his father hadn't forgotten about him, and his father was there waiting and watching and longing for him each day and saying, where are you? Where are you? I'm waiting. And then what happens? Can we see verse 21? Well, the boy goes straight into his rehearsed speech. He's been rehearsing it all the way. Father, I'm sorry, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Verse 21. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He only gets halfway through and the father says, bring the best robe, a sign of honour. Put a ring on his finger, a sign of authority. Sandals on his feet. A slave didn't have shoes, a servant didn't have shoes, a son had shoes. Go and kill the fattened calf. A little boy in Sunday school was asked, and who was not pleased to see the younger son come home? And he shot his hand up and said, that would be the calf. (laughs) But the issue here, and this is the issue, is that God does not, Treat us as we deserve to be treated. I'm trying to talk here about God's generosity. He is so generous with us. You see, there's some people here, and you think, look, Rico, I know. I know. I know authority figures. I know. I know that if I go near God, what's going to happen is he's going to grind my face into the dust. 
I go near God, I've seen it. He'll grind my face into the dust. And I'm saying, I don't know where you got that picture of God. God is so generous. He's so kind. He rejoices to have us home. He does not treat us as we deserve to be treated. A while back, I was at home on my day off, and I was teaching my nephews to play rugby, and they were four and two. So the older one's Dalton. He's a nice kid. I don't know why they called him. That's a stupid name. Sorry if you're... Yeah, well, anyway. He, and, he, and, then, and then the younger one was called Patrick, and I was on the floor in the sitting room teaching Dalton, the four-year-old, to scrummage. So you've got to start him young. So I was down there with the four-year-old, and the two-year-old Patrick got so excited, he picked up a large plant pot, he started to empty it all over the floor to make a pitch. And when I next looked up, I'm not kidding, he had trashed the room. And at that point, my mother walked in, so Patrick's grandmother, and the floor was covered in mud. And she walked over to her grandson, this two-year-old, she picked up the plant pot, she put it on one side, she picked him up and she kissed him, and she said, let's go and have lunch. And as she carried him out of the room, he looked over her shoulder at Dalton and I on the ground, and he went, like that. <laughs> you see, the issue is, he knows his grandmother knows what he's done. He knows she'll clear up the mess. He knows she loves him anyway because he's at home. Now, when you're treated like that by somebody, can I tell you what it does? It unlocks your heart. It's extraordinary what it unlocks in terms of generosity. So Les Mis is all over the place at the moment. Victor Hugo, he said, life's greatest happiness is to be convinced you're loved. I've been a Christian nearly 30 years now. And God treats me just like that. He knows what I've done. He clears up the mess. He loves me anyway. I mean, I, I, just, I just get so exhausted with my own self-centeredness. I do. I think my wife does too. But, but there's just this constant flow of grace. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. But actually, the younger son was fortunate, wasn't he, here, to be seen by his father on the road and not by his older brother. But as you imagine what the older brother, how he'd have teached him, the head of school... I mean, not least because of... Sorry, if you are a head of school, welcome. Lovely to have you here. Not least because verse 31... Have a look down verse 31. Look at verse 31 as we draw to a close. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. So you see, the younger son has already spent his inheritance. So the rest of the estate belongs to this older son. When the father says, bring the robe, ultimately it's the older brothers. When the father says, put a ring on his finger, it's the older brothers. Kill the calf, it's the older brothers. So there is a price, a big cost for this boy to come home. There's the robe, there's the ring, there's the cop, and there's no way this selfish, stingy, angry older brother would pay. But, you know, Christians have a different older brother. In the book of Romans, an epistle, we're told the Lord Jesus is our true older brother, and he is not stingy. So he earned everything. He earned the robe. Look at his life. He earned the robe. He earned the ring. He lived a perfect life, and yet at the end of his life, what happened? They stripped him of his robe. They gambled for it. He didn't get the fattened calf on the cross. He got hyssop and vinegar. And this true older brother, as he dies on the cross, says, the only way for you to be clothed is for me to be stripped. And the only way for you to get the robe and the ring is if I lose them. And the only way for you, to, for you to actually come home is if I go to the cross and I pay in death and blood for you to come home. It's a massive thing that I can come home. It doesn't just happen. It happens because my true older brother, the Lord Jesus, says, Rico, you go home, I'll pay. You go home, I'll pay. It's okay, I'll pay. I'll go to Jerusalem, I'll pay. I'll pay so you can be forgiven. So that you can, you can enjoy the Father's embrace, so that you can know the Father's kiss, so that you can know the overwhelming happiness of saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and the flood of relief and joy in the soul. And you know, there is only one way to hell. The only way I get to hell is if I trample over the cross of Jesus. So Jesus blocks the way to hell. He says, don't go there. I'm your true older brother. Do not go there. I'm blocking the way. I'm paying for you to go home. But if I want to trample over the cross, then I can find my way there. But I've got to trample over the cross of Jesus to get there. He blocks the way. Now, I hope you understand as you hear this why this 
pastoral conversation back in London I was involved with today, why I wish they could understand it, why the guy I was on the phone to who rang me up and said, Rika, I'm reaching out, why I wished he'd get it. I mean, if only you can come home and experience this, if only you can. And just as, just as we close here, I mean, the younger son, he comes home. But what about the older brother? Because it's interesting what the older brother does at this party. Have a look down. Do you see what he does? Verse 28. What does the older brother, as the mirror comes up? The older brother, I mean, we've seen it before. The older brother, verse 28, became angry and refused to go in. Now, if you were a Jewish listener and you knew your Old Testament, as the older brother flips like this, you'd have gone, no, no, don't do that. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 21 in the Old Testament... If you publicly humiliated your father like that, then the result was not corporal punishment. They didn't believe in beating. It was capital punishment. You got stoned. If you publicly did this, so a Jew reading this would go, no, no, don't treat your... I mean, it's as bad as what the younger son has done to publicly humiliate your father like that. I mean, they, they, they would stone rebellious kids like this. I tell you what... It would sort the schools out, wouldn't it? We've had a bit of a problem with Haskins. He'll be stoned on Thursday morning. It would, I mean, it would sort the schools out. Sorry, you think I'm a fascist. I just thought it was, a, you know, there you have it. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, what is it, you see, this is interesting. What is it that causes this older brother to not be in relationship with his father, to shake his fist at his father? And it's in verse 29, and it's fascinating. Have a look, verse 29. What stops him going into the far party? What stops him finding that his father is as central to life as a ball is to a game? What makes him so vicious? Have a look down. Verse 29, but he answered, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Do you know what it is? It's his own goodness. What stops this guy going into his father? It's his own goodness, which is exactly the problem, chapter 15, verse 2, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had. We're good. You're very fortunate to have us around, God. We do our duty, and there's no way that we have to say sorry. There's no way that we need the death of your son for forgiveness. No way. We're good. And you see, his goodness is his weapon of rebellion against God. Let me tell you why I got ordained. It was because from the 1st to the 6th of, of, of April, 1988, I watched my grandmother die in an old people's home. And she died absolutely convinced of her own goodness. Because I'm good, God will accept me. No need of the Christian faith at all. And I watched the desolation and the loneliness. It was my last year at, at university. And I thought, oh, Rico, you can't, you, can't, you can't live your life and let people do this. It, honestly, it drives me. After she died, my mother found £400 in her purse in the old people's home. And she said she liked to keep it by her. It made her feel secure. Rico, I'm good. And because I'm good, I've no need of God's forgiveness. You need to stop talking about this stuff. I'm fine. Now, I don't know where you stand with this, but I'm saying, you know, whether you're a younger son, you've been in a far country, a younger daughter, whether you're one of the older brother types, I'm saying, will you come home? God is so generous. The price has been paid. The older brother, the true older brother, the Lord Jesus Christ has died. So what you have to do is do what, do what that younger son did. He actually climbed out of the pigsty. He headed for home. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean to, to come home? Let's just have a story now that, from somebody that just helps explain what, what that's like. Great. Emma, over to you. Thank you very much, Rico. I'm sure lots of you will have questions following that talk, so the number is on screen now if you'd like to text in those questions. And while you're doing that, I'd really like to invite Bella up onto the stage. Um, Bella is someone who has heard God's call to come home, and she's decided to do that. And she'd like to tell you a bit about what difference that has made in her life. Over to you. Um, Hi, I'm Bella. I'm a second year medic at Exeter. Um... It's a bit surreal for me to be standing here because this time last year I was sitting where you guys are now hearing about Jesus for the first time. Um, before I became a Christian, 
God and Jesus hadn't figured into my thinking at all. I'm not from a Christian family, so um, that's something, something that may have happened or may not have happened 2,000 years ago, just didn't seem relevant to my life. Um, all that mattered to me was my image and like how I appeared to other people, and I found my self-worth and confidence in approval from others. Um, then something unexpected happened. During the week of talks that the CU put on last year, I was having a meal out with some friends, and two of my Christian friends asked me if we wanted to go to the talk. Some friends scooted off to other commitments, but as I had nothing to do that evening, I thought I might as well tag along, put off an impending essay crisis or something. So I did, um, and I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. I'd never thought about Jesus before, but hearing about him for the first time was a huge so shock to the system. One thought really struck me from that talk. The speaker made this point about Jesus. He said that Jesus made radical claims and led a perfect life. And his perfect life therefore proved his radical claims. For some reason, this really bothered me. I thought this was a massively bold assumption. How can a perfect life necessarily justify a claim? So I was really frustrated by this, and I wanted to find out more. So I got some books and went to the follow-up course put on by the CE. There I found out more about the person of Jesus, who he was, and what he did. I found that he was actually really, really cool. This is a guy who actually did lead a life that held up to scrutiny, and his claims, son of God, saviour, gradually became more believable. So I went along to church to find out more. Everyone was really friendly, and I enjoyed the music, and I met people who genuinely believed in this message. Um, and the more I discovered, the more I wanted to believe too. And I knew that I did believe in some ways, but I didn't feel like I believed. This is a massive cliche, but it's true. Believing in God requires your heart and your head. And it made sense, but my heart wasn't in it. So people told me to try to pray. And this was the most terrifying thought. It was easy at church, surrounded by all these believers, to connect to God, but how could I do this all by myself? When, after a long time putting it off with all my might, I finally took the courage to pray to God, I realised faith is not just an intellectual decision to like learn about a period of history 2,000 years ago, but it's also a living, breathing relationship that exists every moment of every day. So how has Jesus changed my life? Jesus Christ loves me and approves of me, not because of the way I look or stuff that I do, but because he made me and he died for me. I'm still getting to know Jesus, and I'm still on a journey to follow him, but what a difference a year makes. There are still challenges, but this is such a great journey to be on. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Bella. Just a couple of things to close. It's very interesting, this story, the prodigal. Actually, we don't know how it ends. We don't know if the younger son was a flash in the pan. We don't know if the older brother went into the party. And Luke leaves that open because he says, you finish the story. You finish it with your story. He holds up the mirror again and he says, well, you finish it. And Emma, in a moment, is going to tell you how you can get more information if you need that to finish the story. Bella had to go and get more information to... to, to finish that story. But for one or two here, actually you may say, no, I know enough. I know enough in my head. I know enough in my heart. And I want to come home. And if that's the case, here's a prayer that enables you to head out of the pigsty and to head home. And it's a prayer in which Christ has done all the work, but it's a wonderful way to start. So I'm going to read it once. And if it's right for you, when I go through it a second time, why not echo it in your own heart? So this is to come home. This is to come back to to God through what the Lord Jesus has done, which is no small thing as our older brother. No small price he paid to get us home. So here it is. Father God, thank you so much that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die so that I can come home. I put my trust in what Jesus did on the cross so I can be forgiven. 
and ask you to be my master. Please come into my life and take complete control of it. It's a huge prayer, but I can trust Christ to lead me. So if that's right for you, and it may be that you've looked at Uncover with a friend, it may be that you've been coming along to church for a while now, it may be that actually you've, been, you've, you've really head and heart, you're ready, can I say, well, why not pray this prayer now? Others, please bear with me as I just uh, pray it for, the, for those, those few people who might be listening. So here's the prayer. Again, if it's right for you to come home now, please come home. Here it is. Father God, thank you so much that you sent your son the Lord Jesus Christ, to die so that I can come home. I put my trust in what Jesus did on the cross so that I can be forgiven and ask you to be my master. Please come into my life and take complete control of it. Amen. Great. If you've prayed that prayer, and or, or want more information, Emma can now tell you what to do, and then we'll have the questions. Great. Um, I hope you have, you've all had a chance to put in your questions, if you had them. So I'll now hand over to our panel. Um, would the three of you just mind telling us who you are, um, what you do, that kind of thing? We've got a mic. Good evening, I'm, my name's Phil, and I work at a church just down the road, mainly with students most of the time. Hi, my name's Michelle, and I work with the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, and we just try to help people get behind the hard questions of faith. My name's Vaughan Roberts, and I also work for a church down the road. I'm a vicar. Great, so can we get the first question up? Is religion important? Can I be a Christian without all the religious stuff? Michelle, lead us forward. Thanks, Rika. Um, I think, actually, I heard Rika tonight talk about home being a place um, where you're accepted and where you belong. Um, and really, I see the difference between the, the word religion as really a set of either ideas or feelings or behaviors that you have to do in order to get to God or that you have to do in order maybe to get to happiness if you don't believe in God or to get to peace. And why we say that the Christian faith is different, why you often hear people that give talks describe it as a relationship is we believe that the difference of the Christian faith is that God has come to us. That it's about his relationship to us. And that being a relationship, that being a place called home that Rico was talking about where it doesn't matter really what we think. It doesn't matter how we behave. It doesn't matter what we feel. God has come to us first. And his extension of himself to us, his offer of relationship to us, finding true peace, true love, true happiness in him changes the way we think changes the way we feel, changes even the way we act, and that really um, faith is about relationship with him. And so, can I be a Christian without all of the religious stuff? I think yes. I think that being a Christian is understanding that you are accepted, that you belong, and once you say yes to that acceptance, it will change everything drastically. But um, yeah, you're accepted often before uh, you realize that you've done the right thing or acted the right way or thought the right thing. Guys, anything to just add? That's great. Well, I need to add, um, once you have been accepted, you want to live the Christian life and you want to help. And uh, th that will mean suddenly a completely different attitude to church and suddenly it doesn't seem like religion. But it's relationship. Relationship with brothers and sisters who want to help you grow to love your father. So it doesn't get you to God. But once you are with God because of his amazing grace, as we've heard tonight, you want help to live the Christian life. Cool, can we get the next question? Isn't it unfair that the father gives the younger brother the robe and ring that the older brother deserves? Shall I have a go? Um, hopefully, I think Rico was clear that the older brother doesn't deserve it. And that's the starting point, is that he was just as far away from his father 
as the younger brother was, in that he lived at home, sure, but he kept his distance from his father. He, he, he was seeking to try and approve his, win his father's approval, uh, but in, in this, all the time getting further and further away from his father, not loving him, but fearing him and trying to serve him to earn his favour. So um, it's not a question of deserving. Mm. No, none of them deserve it. Or neither of them deserve it. And I guess the analogy to us today is that none of us deserve God's forgiveness. Uh, we either you know, publicly and extravagantly push him out of our lives, or we do that privately and, and subtly, but we all do it. And therefore, no one deserves God's forgiveness. So I think that's the story, isn't it? I think the word deserve is, a, is, is just so far from Christian faith. I mean, what do I deserve? Well, uh, this is a brutal point, so it, it, but I, you know, I deserve judgment. I've lived in God's world without reference to him. I've made myself God. Uh, you know, if we're talking about deserving, it gets pretty heavy. Great. Next question. I'm like the prodigal son and have no regrets. I don't feel like I need to come home. What about me? Well, it's a question about reality, isn't it? So if the reality is that there's no God, then um, you don't have to feel regret about not being at home because there is no home. There's whatever home you make for yourself in the universe. There's, there's no fundamental meaning. But if reality is that there is a God who made you and loves you, but you've turned away from him, then uh, whether we regret it or not, guilt is not just a feeling, it's a fact. And we need his forgiveness. And the amazing truth is that we might not feel anything about God, we might not have thought about God for years, if ever, consciously, but he thinks about us and he feels passionately towards us and he loves us and he wants us back. It's not about how I feel, it's about reality. And that's the big question. And we're, we're talking about not just feelings here, but reality. Is there a God? And if he is, what kind of God is he? Is he the God who's revealed himself, as we Christians believe, in the person of his son, Jesus Christ? In which case, whether you love him or not, he loves you passionately. Right. Okay, I think we've got time for one more. Isn't God and Christianity just an emotional crutch for people? Michelle. Um, I think that that links in even to that last question that we just heard. I, I'm happy as I am. I, I'm not broken. I haven't tripped. I don't need anything. And Rico, your message was great, maybe. Um, but, but I haven't fallen down, and, and I don't need help. And I don't need acceptance. And um, I think that the whole idea of there being something else, of there being something greater, um, Often when we are happy, we don't think about that. But I think that even our happiness, even our fulfillment, even the best relationships, even the greatest success or the greatest marks or the highest first, that um, it's a taste of something wonderful. And then when we taste something wonderful, um, often we want more. And maybe, maybe the desire um, for something more, maybe we don't couch it in terms like I have a crutch or I need something different or I've fallen down. But once we get a taste of something sweet, I, I defy anyone to say they don't want even more of that sweetness. I think often when we've tasted something or gotten a success, it creates in us that hunger for more and it's unsatisfiable. And I guess um, what we say God is and Christianity and what Jesus offers us in security is that it's not because just that we are empty. It's not because just that we have fallen down. It's not because we are broken, but even the ones that have found the most wholeness or have had the most all of their lives get that experience of home, get that reality that Vaughn was talking about of truth and love and peace and even the most wonderful of relationships, even the greatest successes go, um, in the Bible it talks about going from glory to glory and that might sound foreign to us, but it's almost like the best things in life get even sweeter, get even greater. Um, so I guess I would just have you think about the best thing that you've ever gone through, or the, um, the greatest success you've ever had, maybe that going on forever, that being extended into eternity, and that is the offer and promise of the Christian faith. 
I guess the flip side of that as well is that actually I, I want to say that God and Christianity is, is way more than an emotional crutch. Uh, Jesus is my lifeboat. He's, he's my everything. Without him, I, I do not have life or breath or anything. I depend on him for my all. And so um, turning, to, turning to God is, is turning to him to give me what I need, which is new life, which is forgiveness, which is acceptance, which is salvation. Um, and even to pick me up and uh, put life into my spiritual uh, lungs, if you like, put air into my spiritual lungs and give me life again. He's way more than a crutch. He's, he's my everything. And so that's the flip side of what Michelle's talking about. The, the life to the full that we have in Christ um, is given to people who recognize they have no spiritual life and they are dead without him. Um, and so I think you know, I look to the Lord Jesus as someone who's, who's way more than a crutch. Great. Thanks. Give the panel a round of applause.